after doing a bunch of these really fun projects, uh, Valve Software hired me. So that's very probably relevant. Yeah. So Gabe and and the folks up there in Seattle hired you to work on AR, right? Is that what I read correctly? No, uh, No, they didn't really have a vision. So the story of Valve goes like this. I was working for a company. One of the mechanical engineers we brought in, he's like, I'd like a plastic press for doing injection molding. I'm like, those things are a half million dollars. That's it's a little excessive for kind of a fun thing to have. Like mm-hmm. right, half million dollars. Yeah. He's like, I think it'll be valuable. Turned out it wasn't valuable. But we went to Gabe about it, and Gabe's like, hold on a second. He looked at his watch. Okay, we can afford it. <laughs> <laughs> a game that you might have that really fits well on our system. We have the ability to help fund bringing it over to our system. So I'm happy to talk to you guys about, you know, anyone oh. about that. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Jerry. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. Excited to uh, chat with you tonight. Yeah, very excited too. So uh, what part of the world are you uh, zooming in from tonight? I am in Silicon Valley, ah. kind of the cheap seats, Fremont, if you want to know where. Okay. Yeah, that's 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 the epicenter. That's the place to be, right? So oh, we've got Tesla over here. I can throw a rock and hit the back of their building. Okay. Can he hit Elon with a rock? That maybe, maybe, I would yeah. like to actually, but that's a different podcast, probably. <laughs> yeah, I, I can see you and me both. Um, so, what's your current title and role? I am the CEO of Tilt Five, um, which mm-hmm. is terribly exciting, going from engineering to executive level stuff. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to mix things up and kind of get in your career career journey because. You know, it's amazing from like the research and, and things I'd done. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm curious about your background from, you know, the computer store chain to designing computer chips to doing AR to doing Tilt 5. Like, you know, share uh, with your audience, with the audience here, kind of like that, your story, because I think it's oh my fascinating. Goodness. How much time do you have? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, I have to, sometimes I have to start with my childhood because I'm a I'm a little bit of a, I was a warped child in some ways, which um, led me down some interesting career paths. But, you mm-hmm. know, to kind of keep it brief, um, as a kid, I was like one of these super interested in science, technology, anything. I just needed to know how it worked. Mm-hmm. Um, fortunately for me, my father bought me a Commodore 64 when I was mm-hmm. quite young. And I asked him, oh, yeah. 6502 all the way. But I was super young at the time. Like I barely, I didn't know how to program at all or do anything on it. I spent a lot of time just typing on it, like draw house. And it would be like syntax error, paint house. But eventually, you know, my father got me some books and magazines and I started doing stuff on it. Right. Um, I was also like super fascinated with how things work. So I would take apart all my toys, including the Commodore 64. I ended up breaking a couple of them. And at one point, my father decided to stop buying me like actual toys because he found that I was more interested in taking things apart. And he owned a gas station in our local town. Okay. And he put a box out front, like, bring your broken electronics. And it was delightful for years oh, and wow. years. I got yeah, big right. boxes of old radios and I would just strip them down to like individual little bits. And I uh-huh. didn't even know at the time what half this stuff did. But fortunately right. for me, in this little tiny logging town that I lived in, there were a couple of ham radio operators. Um, hmm. So ham radio operators, these are amateur radio guys, and they tend to build a lot of their own electronic stuff. So they yeah. um, started teaching me electronics, which I combined with my passion for computers. Mm-hmm. But then that kind of led into, you know, after a very tumultuous, like, you know, teen years of being kind of like going <laughs> from this. Rebellion. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. I was a sweet child that, you know, all the bullies could make cry. And then all of a sudden I figured out after like clobbering one of the bullies with a big biology book that um, <laughs> I'm like presented as kind of badass. Uh, people leave me alone. And then I went through this wild phase, this gothy phase. Um, uh, okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Which kind of leads into like my first like real career. Um, so as a teenager, I was helping my dad at his gas station. So he was teaching me about cars, started off like changing oil and doing stuff like that. They got pretty advanced. And, you know, in this kind of redneck uh, logging town, there were like racetracks around. And we'd occasionally mm. go to the racetrack. And I got enamored with racing. Like, if I'm going to be badass, I need to be a race car driver. Yeah, there you go. 
And I uh, got completely obsessed with that. Tried to convince my father who had raced in the past to build me a race car. And he was like, no, you're going to kill yourself. No way. And I just started pestering him. And uh, eventually he caved and he's like, there's only two ways that you can get into racing. That's mm -hmm. if you save up enough money to buy a car. You know, at the time, minimum wage was $3 an hour or three twenty-five an hour. Yeah, I remember that. So I wasn't yeah. going to buy one. So, um, and I learned my lessons about mentors, like the ham radio guys. I'm like, I bet if I find some mentors teach me how to weld and machine things and fabricate, I could probably build one. They don't look that complicated. So I mm -hmm. found a machine shop in town and I oh. exchanged work on the weekends for um, the owner of the shop teach me how to do all the machining I needed to do. And wow. Um, my father was still a little resistant to it, but then he came around and my first year out racing cars was terrible. I like came in almost dead last out of season points because I knew nothing about, you know, how to set up race cars or racing. It turns out there's, yeah. you can't just, if you drive on the street, you can't just drop into a race car and be good. But yeah. I've had more mentors that took me under their wing and taught me how to actually set the cars up. And I think very important, this leads to parts of like how I've been successful in my career. They taught me things about promoting myself. Um, you need to promote yourself to get sponsors so that you can buy better cars to go faster. Right, this right, to pay for exactly. shit. Yeah, yeah, right. Also, how to interact with my fan base, because if the fans love you, then the track owners love you because you bring a crowd each time and they buy mm. lots of beer and nachos. Hot dogs and, and nachos. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Calling. So, yeah, I learned a lot during that. I actually became quite good. I had British Petroleum sponsoring me towards the end. Wow. And, yeah, I was running the circuit up and down the West Coast called the I-5 Challenge. Was um, it ovals or, like, what kind of racing was it? Is, it was I'm a kind of a car dirt track cars. So this was... Okay. Uh, Two different types of cars I race. This was sprint cars and uh, late models, the ones that look like wedges of cheese. All V8. Yeah, powered. yeah, yeah. With the big, the big wings, and they're always sideways, just going in yeah, a circle. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, my heart, my heart's going like crazy now, just thinking of like the track. Yeah, the adrenaline rush, right? Just being out there, and yeah. I, I, what I loved I'm, about I'm, the race cars is because I was fabricating my own chassis and. I could just innovate and I was constantly like tweaking things. I made my own traction control system, which ran on with a 6502 processor. <laughs> <laughs> traction Bring control back was to like the, a right. really new thing in the early 90s. Um, okay. And it hadn't been on that type of race car before. So huh. I started dominating. A bunch wow. of my stuff that I did got banned, though. Right. Yeah. Cause you get too good. And they're like, Whoa, 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 we got to make it even here. And they start banning. Right. So yeah. Yeah. That's the thing is once you kind of figure out the motivations and the stakeholders, like the track promoters, they really want tight racing. They don't want someone just winning all the time. Right. It's boring. People leave early then or something. Yeah. 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 Not as much beer and nachos. So. Right. <laughs> but just like a light switch, it just, you know, it was a hard business to be in. It just like, I was done with it. And right. I had been doing this for like four or five years, and I went to visit one of my friends at the time that uh, I went to school with, and mm -hmm. he'd already started a family, he had a house, and he had a man cave in the garage. Mm -hmm. And I'd never really given up on computers this entire time, even though I was like way into automotive stuff. Mm -hmm. But I went into his man cave, and he showed me this 486 computer that he had built. And mm -hmm. This was around 1995. Okay. And he was so proud because he had tricked a parts wholesaler to give him all the parts and they thought that he was oh, in business. And right. so he's like, you know, it cost me whatever, $600 to build this computer. And it's really like a $1,500, $1,600 computer. And I've always had a bit of an entrepreneurial bend to me as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, whoa, that's really good margin, especially in yeah, the 90s. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because this was before Windows 95 had come out. Okay. Yeah. DOS 3.1 and all that. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. That. Yeah. And so we cooked up the scheme of opening a computer store. And so yeah. I sold all my race gear, took all my money, invested in this computer store, and went into a partnership with them. Wow. But keep in mind, I was still doing the gothy thing. I'd never really given that, <laughs> that up. <laughs> <laughs> you listen to Bauhaus and uh, you get the black hair and everything. So, yeah. Guar, you know, Guar, yeah. ridiculous stuff. Um, so we opened this computer store and it was like perfect timing. Windows 95, um, was just coming out. Everyone was getting AOL discs in the mail. Right. Oh God. Yes. It was so good. 
he was a locksmith and um he's like well get the store going once it's profitable enough we'll both come in and work but what happened as soon as the store was going enough for him to come in of course I'm really rough around the edges, swearing every third word. <laughs> and of course we start fighting and he like, he like we're just butting heads. He ended up pushing me out of the business. It was like this huge, uh, terrible, like business breakup, devastating. Yeah. yeah. Um, too bad. So I go, go back to my apartment and I'm like moping and crying and, you know, very distraught about this. And of course I had dropped out of high school at this point too. So, hmm. Cause I'd been so successful in race cars that. Right. Like why screw around with that? Yeah. I, I can race. Yeah. So I, I reach out to, you know, my best friend, my father, and I'm like, what should I do? And he's like, well, you should get your GED, go to school, get your life back on track. You had a good run. Like, sorry, mm-hmm. it happened. So I was sitting there and I'm like, no, F this guy. Like. <laughs> <laughs> i'm not going that route yeah 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 that sounds like too pedestrian for me right yeah so i went to the guy i was renting the apartment from like can i break the lease and i got my deposit back and i was couch surfing for a while and i found this little tiny retail space down the street from my original from my business partner yeah opened a computer store didn't have any money to buy inventory so I took everything I could just get some store fixtures in there and make it look like a store. It used to be a barber shop. It's kind of funny. There was a barber <laughs> chair that I just unbolted and threw out the back door. <laughs> right. To get rid of the and, red and white thing going. And yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. I should have kept that. It's probably worth a lot of money today. Mm. Anyway. Um, right. But I didn't have any money for inventory. So what I would do at night is I would go jump in his dumpster and get all the colorful boxes from the stuff he was selling. I just put it on the Oh, you're right. Yeah, like you can have this if you give me the money, then I'll order it. Exactly. Yeah. It was robbing Peter to pay Paul. People would come in, and I just, I kind of, in my mind, I'm like, okay, I will not be undersold. My job is to put him out of business. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and <laughs> um, yeah, and people would come in, like, oh, I want the sound card. I'm like, oh, that one's already taken, but if you give me like three quarters of it, I'll go get you one. And I kind of started bootstrapping the business. But fortunately, another mentor came into my life at this point. Across the street from my store was a real estate guy. And he was a kind of successful businessman in in town. And he was also a computer guy. So he'd Mm. come over at lunch. And I was getting really skinny at this point because I was not having a lot of money to buy food, eating ramen noodles and stuff. And living in the back of the computer store. Oh, wow. Back there. Damn. So he'd bring me lunch and then he started telling me about there's this thing called relatability. You know, you know, the Doc Martens and <laughs> right. the dark eyeliner and the, right, weird the black color. mascara and all that. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 He's like, you know, you just kind of need to look the part and then people will trust you. And I like I trusted him because he was so successful. And I started making mm-hmm. these changes. And like, sure enough, like business started taking off. People could relate to me better. Right, And it was just a grand time to own a computer store. We were selling so much inventory. It quickly put my business partner out of business. <laughs> Crushed him. He was gone. That's awesome. We had people, we would get deliveries like once a week. We'd have it freighted in. And I didn't have a loading dock at this little store. So they would drop the pallets on the sidewalk. And I'd start hiring people to work with me. So I'd have one Don't person yeah. like watching the pallets on the front to right. make sure no one's stealing it's- it. We're tearing them down and people were so excited they would show up there'd be like lines of people and we'd be going through like oh. weekly orders and here's your voodoo one card and here's a sound blaster and <laughs> sound blast right it's audio card yeah right here's your rendition uh 3d card or whatever yeah right. it's funny i collect vintage computers it's something i always kind of done and before it was you know trendy to do but in recent years all of this stuff that we were selling back then um, is become highly collectible, like a sound blaster card. You're going to pay like a hundred bucks or something for mm. it. Back in those days, we were upgrading people so fast. We had a big plastic drum in the back of the store where we would just take all the old cards, like Voodoo One cards, and we'd just unceremoniously just slam them into this oh, waste. Right. And, Get them out of here. Yeah. 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 And some gold scrapper would come by and we'd just give right. them the barrel. Pennies on the dollar. Yeah. And 
you know, now I look back, I'm like, oh, I should have put those in a storage unit. I'd be rich. Yeah. Um, but I ended up expanding that business. I ended up having five stores up and down I-5 in uh, Oregon and Washington. Wow. And uh, it was it was great. I learned a lot about hiring people at that point. So it was mm. really a great time for me to learn how to put teams together. And okay. Yeah, you know, early when I was hiring people, I would hire people like, oh, you went to, you know, the local community college to learn about PC repair or something to hire them. And, mm. and you know, they, sometimes they were good and sometimes they weren't. But the right. I started to learn the folks that were phenomenal, were passionate about it. Right. So, yeah. It wasn't just a paycheck. Yeah. They were into it. Yeah, like some of my technicians that come in on a Sunday, they'd be in the back, they'd set up a land party or something, or they would, you know, they'd be back there working. I'm like, hey, I'm not paying you overtime to be like fixing computers. And they're like, no, no, it's just so fun. So that was pretty phenomenal up until the year 2000. And it was just, it just didn't seem like it was ever going to end. And especially approaching year 2000, everyone was upgrading because their computers were going to stop. Right. right. Yeah. The whole world was going to stop. Right. Yeah. That was yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. So it was amazing running the stores doing during this time because we were just making so much money leading up to Y2K and then everything just fell off a cliff right at Y2K because yeah. everybody had upgraded their computers and then all of the margins in the computers and software had gone to almost nothing. We had like e-machines and mm -hmm. gateway computers all just, you know, almost giving away the hardware and uh so we found ourselves in this really tough situation. I would, had this business now that was just bleeding money like crazy Yeesh. right after Y2K. And no one was buying because they'd already upgraded. Yeah. And this was a really interesting learning point for me as far as like managing people. Because I was just super naive. I didn't have any like, I'm not an MBA, so I didn't know like the proper way to manage a business at oh, this point. Oh, yeah. Right. So... You know, I was just extremely transparent with everyone in the company. I'm like, at this rate, I'm not going to be able to make payroll in X number of months, weeks. And mm. what was really amazing and heartwarming about this like time is like, of course, we lost a few people that, you know, they for reasons they needed to have stability. But yeah. everyone rallied around trying to pivot the company into something else. So. We invested in a network gaming center just in time for like where one of our stores, like they installed ISDN and it just kind of started eroding away our ability oh. to have like, you know, network gaming. Yeah. Um, we started doing satellite dishes and cell phones and network installs, but we really didn't find, you know, anything to really get back into, you know, that same hyper profitable yeah. situation. Yeah. And, I kept losing money and finally it got to the point where, okay, I give up. I, I just don't know where to go with this. So I offered the company, the businesses, these five different stores to the mm. managers. I'm like, if you want to keep trying and somehow you can make it and you can just pay me for the inventory in the future. Great. If you can't make it, no big deal. They're yours. Mm. And we ended up closing a store and, and the managers kept trying and, you know, one by one, they failed except for one, a little tiny town outside of Portland called Canby, Oregon. It's still there today. Wow. Today. Yeah, yeah. That's impressive. So if you're in Canby, Oregon, go patronize computers made easy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but at this point I'm basically broke because I'd kind of put all the chips on the table to try to make this work out. And I, I took a little, you know, uh, minimum wage job, you know, and it was like a real hit on my kind of lifestyle because I was riding high there for a while. Yeah. But I went to my father again. I'm like, what should I do? And he's like, well, that was a great run. You know, <laughs> get your GED. Da, da, yeah, da, da, da. <laughs> You're smart. Right. You know, you can you know, go do anything. And um, during this entire time when I had the computer stores, I'd continued as a hobby doing electronics in a pretty serious way. And I had the money to buy expensive equipment and tools and i mm. was doing circuit boards and fpga design okay. just for fun and i'd heard about this mythical place called silicon valley where you know college dropouts can become like huge and successful and mm. I'm like well maybe i can make that work so i started flying down to silicon valley and just going to trade shows and meeting people and i had a little duffel bag with all these little circuit boards of like things that i'd built like 
video generators and a thing that can generate sound and a keyboard interface and just these hobby projects. Hmm. And I would just go booth to booth and I would be shaking everyone's hands and just like trying to figure out who people were. And I'm like, Oh, do you want to see my circuit boards? And I ended up getting opportunities to go interview for jobs Hmm. and uh, they were terrible. Like it was (laughs) (laughs) because I'd walk in the door, I'd get an introduction and it was just like talk, you know, a lot of times I'd be talking to HR over the phone and they wouldn't even like, let me come in to interview. But when I did get interviews, I'd, you know, inevitably hit like the one person in the interview panel that was like, uh, I see that you race cars really cool. You had computer stores and you've made all this IP. I'd list all the IP that I okay. created to try to flesh out my resume. Mm-hmm. Where'd you go to school? I'm like, I didn't. And I just kind of like cut the interview uh... off. But I got really fortunate um, and I was really in a hard money position at this point. Like I got down to where it was hard for me to even fly from Portland down to Silicon Valley because it was too costly. So I was taking Greyhound buses, which is just a terrible way to travel. Oof. To, to yeah, I can imagine. Interviews. So I hopped on this Greyhound bus and drove you know, all through the night to get to this one interview, I go in, they cut it short. I'm coming down the stairs out of the building. And I, the person I'd met at the trade show was the founder of the company. He's like, where are you going? And they're like, well, they cut the interview short. And he's like, well, have you talked to, you know, these people? And I'm like, Mm -hmm. no, he's like, come with me. And he just pulled all the engineers together and we did a panel interview and he just hosted the whole thing. My first ever panel interview, which is my Favorite way to do an interview, by the way. You, like three, four, five people around. You're, you're talking that kind of panel around a yeah, desk? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where it's just, they're just rapid fire asking yeah, you questions. Like, choo, 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 choo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love it. Love being interviewed that way. Anyway, he's. Not just, many people do. <laughs> so in recruiting, usually that's like their worst nightmare. So that's, that's an interesting take. But okay. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, I mean, I did improv in high school. And oh, it just, okay. it's a little bit of my theater background, just thinking right. on feet, feet and it's just feet. a thrill. Yeah. I know it's weird. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it it works for you. So did they hire you? And, and, and who was this person? The company was called EtherWire and I'm spacing the name now, but they were doing a wireless um, device for first responders, uh, which used low frequency to like ping pong off of all of like firefighters. They'd wear one of these devices and it would monitor their... Oh. Yeah, they hired me. Um, it was a really exciting project, and my piece of it was really ridiculous and small. But this was my chance, and it, and they got me really cheap. It was like twelve dollars an hour. It's like I look back, and it's like this guy really took advantage of me. But right, foot the door. Yeah. Uh, I took it very serious, and I did a really good job for them, and um, was able to do a couple projects with them. And from that, um, I got recommendations to the next job, and. Mm-hmm the next job and the next job. And then pretty soon my resume, you know, started filling up with things and it didn't matter. I didn't have to like try to explain why I'm fresh in the industry and don't have a degree. Yeah. Right. Cause you had all Um, this experience so that, yeah. Cool. And I also got to start to connect with mentors down here, meet like really amazing people like Wozniak took me under his like, you know, Really? You know, his wing at one point. Steve and, Wozniak, the Wozniak. Wow. That's, yeah, that's impressive. Yeah. Wow. And it's just like, I'd been like reading about these like legends in magazines and never thought that I would right. get to like hang out with various people. Al Alcorn from Atari. And it's just okay. like, I got to like start to meet these people. And I found one thing with mentors and I, I think I just stumbled onto it is like people will go out of their way to help you if you are just enthusiastic about what they want to teach you. And especially, mm. I don't want to sound ageist or anything, but there's a lot of like really smart, older uh, engineers out there Yeah, that, you know, sometimes their stories are long and you know, <laughs> like my story, I guess, <laughs> but, yeah, but yeah. But, you know, I was eager to hear these stories and like, yeah, so what they're talking about vacuum tube computers, <laughs> super fascinating. And it turns out like these little nuggets of wisdom you, you pick up, sometimes you get to apply those in the work that you're doing. You know, it's mm-hmm. like, oh, you know, I want to put a microchip in here, but, you know, you, 
Al Alcorn told, told me how he did it with a transformer, which is much cheaper. Like, oh, that's the right solution just for uh. this one problem I've got. And it was very valuable. Um, something else happened is I started getting into these networks of engineers that I could drag from project to project. So I was just doing, you know, project based stuff. And okay. so I developed this reputation of like, call Jerry if you need to like solve a tough problem. And mm. I would, if it sounded interesting, I would accept it even if I didn't know. And sometimes I would be working all night, all day, trying to solve these problems. And then I could call in other contractors that I became associated with right. to solve these problems. And still do that quite a bit today. Yeah, you know, even a firefighter. Like, yeah, yeah. 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 And I learned a lot of lessons about working that way. And it was tough at first, especially being a female engineer, um, that you have a couple cards stacked against you. And then being a contract person to come in to solve problems, you know, the old guard that's there, they're right, struggle, like, struggling or maybe not struggling. Sometimes yeah. they're not actually struggling. Mm -hmm. You walk in the door and their boss says like, Jerry and her team's here to like save your butt. It's absolutely the worst thing. Right. So the, 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 the guard comes up, right? They're like, I'll show her and her team. I'm not going to be stood up. Yeah, yeah. But I learned a couple tricks, um, you know, go talk to all the stakeholders. Don't come in like a bull in a china shop. Mm -hmm. You know, just listen a lot. Bring donuts in. <laughs> right. Yeah. Have a bowl of candy on your desk so that people will walk up to get a piece of candy oh. and smile and say, what are you working on? What's going on? Yeah, and, yeah. That's a good one. Um, you break down those barriers and then you can be productive. And, you know, a good portion of the time, folks really weren't um, struggling. It was just the mm. problem they were tasked with from management was just too, you know, deadlines, just yeah. impossible. You know, right. and as soon as you could break that down, get working and be productive, you can solve their problems. So I got to work on a lot of really exciting projects over the years. I got into doing chip design, which was fun. Mm -hmm. um, have a chip that was in the original TiVo. Um, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, it's like really cool to like be on a team that designed this chip. And then you guys, you go see it at the Fry's Electronics sitting there. It's like, ah, one of my That's, things is in yeah, there. Yeah, I'm in that. I did that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, what really busted my career open was, uh, one day I got a call, uh, from a toy company that had saw some online stuff that I've been doing. I had been reverse engineering the old Commodore 64 and just for fun and making yeah. an FPGA implementation of it. Hmm. And they're like, you know, at the time, um, there was this fad of these little joysticks where you could put some double A batteries in the bottom, plug it into your TV and play the classic Atari games. Oh, yeah. And they yeah. wanted to do this for the Commodore 64. Right. I, I bought uh, them for so my sons. Uh, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. 20 bucks. Yeah. Jax or what? J -X -X. Jack Pacific. Yeah. 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 NSI. Right. Yep. MGA worked for all of them. Um, okay. But they, uh, they've been trying to do the Commodore 64 and the way they used to do like the Ataris and Colecos and stuff is they'd get the, there was a Nintendo on a chip and they would just port over, or, you know, recreate uh, the games. But the okay. Commodore was too complicated and so they hired me to make a custom chip that emulated the Commodore 64 in real hardware. Oh, so, okay. Um, and actually, I got ahead of myself. This was before I'd actually done a full custom chip before. So I actually ended up making a chip for the toy guys. And it was one of those things, like, they're like, hey, we need to get this done in a year. Can you do it? And I took a big gulp. And I'm like, yeah, no problem. Having never done a custom chip before. <laughs> <laughs> And we assembled a team, so we had a couple programmers that were like savvy with old six five oh two code that were gonna like tweak the games so that we could load them off flash and then mm -hmm. as fast as I could, I started making an f p g a dev board for them, and I gave it to them and um super exciting project uh we ended up being a little late um the poor programmers didn't even have color video output until two weeks before we were gonna think <laughs> about the chip wow um so I'm like, trust me, the color will be there. And this, right. yeah, it will this come. Is the, the color that you should expect if you right. poke this value into this register. <laughs> right. Just set it in there. <laughs> that was a scary project too, because we were coming in so hot and so late. Um, they didn't have time to make any test chips. So what they had to mm. do is they were going to build 250,000 of these things. So wow. this one had made 250,000 
chips, which is millions of dollars worth of right. faith on me that I did it right. I'm just <laughs> petrified the whole time. Yeah. I get this call like early in the morning after they did the first like pilot run in China with this angry New Yorker yelling at me that design didn't work and that I was getting on a plane and going to China and I'm going to fix it. <laughs> It was, I was like, wow, maybe I should just run to Mexico and hide because <laughs> I, I don't know how many millions of dollars I lost this company. Right. But the, the kind of quick story on that is like, I'd never been out of the United States before at that point. And I had to admit this to the, the toy guys. I'm like, I don't even have a passport. Yeah. We're flying yeah. you to San Francisco. Same day you're getting your passport. So do all this work and then go to Hong Kong. And then we're going to get you visa same day when you land. And then you're going to the factory in China and you're fixing it. I'm like, Oh my God, I'm so scared. <laughs> <laughs> so in like two or three days I was over there and it, we ended up, I got on the production line we opened up one of the toys and I looked at the circuit board and I'm like, this is not the circuit board design I sent you. And they're like, Oh, we cost reduced it. <sighs> and this goes all the way back to the ham radio operators. One of them told me your best debugging tool is your finger. Just start touching things. Oh, to see if you get a, a jolt or, a sh or, or, yeah. or it influences the circuit. Right. Oh. Huh. And so I started like putting my fingers on the circuit board and then all of a sudden it like, bloop, it started up and I'm like, Oh, thank goodness. The chip worked. And I'm like, put all the components back that you took off of it. Right. I won't go into all the technical details, but they've right. taken all these critical like capacitors. Oh, right, to that. save money. Yeah, yeah. We, we oh, got... yeah, yeah. The toy industry is extremely Yeah, costly. it's all margins and cutthroat and all that. Yeah, I have friends who have been in it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They, they always, you have to watch them like a hawk because they'll take your prototypes and they'll just start pulling parts off until it stops working and then they'll put the last part back in. And that's what they think they can produce. Okay. So Even if the part's it. like a fraction of a penny. Yeah. Right. And right. Um, but another funny story in this. Now we're getting into stuff that maybe game developers will find interesting. <laughs> is the, um, So the programmers and I colluded to put Easter eggs into this. And ah, so, there you go. And we're all naive and young, and we didn't know that, you know, toys have like a rating on them. And they wanted mm -hmm. this toy to be rated for like 12 and up or something. Yeah. And E for so, everyone or something. Yeah. So... I had put together a documentation of how to take apart the toy and solder wires to it so you could download your own games to it and hook your own external keyboard and turn it to a full Commodore 64 and do all this really cool hacking and stuff with it. Wow. The programmers uh, put pictures of us like drinking beer with famous programmer, uh, Jim <laughs> Butterfield was his name, and, uh, and a bunch of extra games in there. One of them called Cliff Diver, where you have to jump off the top of a cliff and you have to do the right number of twirls and land on the rocks below, right on your head and crack your head open. And if you do really well, you get a death twitch. Like, <laughs> so anyway, all this stuff's in there and I'm like four or five days at the factory and I decide to drop into the secret menu and one of the toy program managers was like there with me and he's like, what is that? I'm like, oh, we added things. And like he's like, oh, this is bad, and, and right. took off. <laughs> and I didn't hear much about it <laughs> until I got back to the states. And remember answering machines? My mm -hmm. answering machine was full. Oh of shit! Screamy, yelly. Um, uh, <laughs> oh shit! Messages from this toy executive, like you've ruined me. Like you know, the toy rating. You're never going to work in the industry again. That's like, really uh, mad. All right. Um, so the guy I was dating at the time, he was like, well, since you're ruined in the toy industry, why don't we make a fake blog and reveal to the world how to access, you know, the Easter eggs? Because it was pretty obscure how to get to it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Super. Yeah. I'm like, whatever. Right. And so he did a good job of making this fake blog post where it was like a worker in the factory who liked to tinker and hack things. And oh, he, yeah. He backed different it, angle. You know, and somehow he managed to get it on the front page of Slashdot like the week before the oh. product launched. Again, That's... in comes more Boom. like a angry phone calls. Like, we know you're behind this. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my goodness. We're going to sue you. Right. Some high strength pissed off New Yorker. Like, I'm going to fucking do it. You know, with this <laughs> yeah, cigar. Exactly. Yeah, I, I can just imagine. 
That describes them exactly. I mean, I'm still in touch with them today. I actually went and visited them a couple of months ago. I, we have a great relationship. But <laughs> anyway, the thing sold out. The, the initial launch was going to be on the home shop, QVC Home Shopping Network, which oh, is God. a really, really weird place to sell them. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a strange market. They forgot to take me off of the mailing list with um, QVC. Mm -hmm. Turns out those numbers on the corner of QVC, those are real numbers. And you get an hourly update of how many units are are selling. And it's just, they launched it at midnight and people were like, had this pent up demand to come get it. They were logging in at midnight and buying this thing. And it's like tens of thousands of these things are going. Right. And QVC people are like, what the hell is going on? Like, I was on the threads. They're like, we don't understand what's going on because, you know, we're only promoting this domestically, but like almost 50% of the sales are going to, you know, other countries. Oh, right. Like Europe and stuff. Yeah. Boom. They sold out like, you know, five days or something. It was sold out. (laughs) And then funniest thing, I got this call from this toy executive. Way to go, kiddo. He's like, don't I believed in you. I knew you could do it. I trusted you and it all worked out. Let's do another one. Yeah. Yeah, and then we did a bunch of toys together, which is <laughs> really fun. It's a hard right. business, but really exciting. Yeah. From there, I went on to do chips, um, did aerospace. I worked on uh, rockets. Mm. I'm a little out of order, but I did the navigation and telemetry system for the Astro rocket, the one that maybe four or five years ago flew sideways off the launch pad. Oh, okay. okay. Another one of these deals, like a small startup, they're running mm. out of money. Um, Call for, Jerry. Some re- for some reason, the um, electrical engineering team rage quit on him and he didn't have a team at all. <laughs> so I was just like in between things. So I'm like, well, I have a four month window. And he's like, great, we're out of money in four months. We got to get this off the launch pad. And I'm like, okay. Like, yeah, right. when we, we got cool. her done. That's cool. A typical startup trying to be too big for their britches, as my father would call it. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's, I walk yeah. in the door and again introduced us like jerry's gonna save the day and i'm starting to break down the the barriers but at this point i kind of don't have as many f's to give um right yeah for certain like inefficiencies so like they're super rigid they're like well we're gonna have our stand up at 7 a.m and we're gonna be doing scrum on this and i'm like 7 a.m yeah i'm like no right like you will have a flat computer at the end of this. Like I am not doing scrum on this. <laughs> no scrum uh, mastering got, me. Yeah. We got her done. Yeah. Um, 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 but it backing up a little bit after doing a bunch of these really fun projects, uh, valve software hired me. So that's very probably relevant. Yeah. So Gabe and, and the folks up there in Seattle hired you to work on AR, right? Is that what I read? correctly or? no uh no. they didn't really have a vision so the story of valve goes like this i was working for a company pretty happy on this project and i'm a pinball collector and a vintage computer collector and i go to these shows and mm-hmm. i also have a youtube channel like at some point i worked at this company that made a streaming box back when streaming we just couldn't do it from a computer it was oh, a special yeah. dedicated box so I kind of got into doing streaming and YouTube and I created this following of people that would just tune in to watch me do like amateur science in my garage. And it was kind of my way to do give mentoring back. Yeah. Right. So, you know, um, on the channel, I make my own semiconductors at home, my own little chip lab, and I have an electron microscope and all this like weird gear that I would just talk about. Mm-hmm. Anyway, Gabe had somehow stumbled onto me and on the same YouTube channel, I talked about like, user interfaces and and, you know alternate devices you know for toys or Mm -hmm. or or gaming interfaces and he got enamored with me so he sent his guys out to these different trade shows like the pinball shows and i'd be like playing pinball and like someone would like slip up next to me and like hey you're jerry right (laughs) <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, which it wasn't super uncommon being a YouTuber and yeah, right. yeah, yeah. known in the pinball space or something. But right. they're like, hey, we're from Valve Software, and we really want to talk to you about setting up an R&D lab. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. Like, I've been around companies that do software that think they want to get into hardware. Not too interested. So I'm right. like, not really taking their bait. 
go to Maker Fair. They show up at Maker Fair. I think I was at a retro show. And it's just they kept showing up at these events. <laughs> and then finally, like Facebook or something, Gabe Newell like followed me on there. And he's like, hey, I'm Gabe. And I didn't follow Val that close. So I was just mm-hmm. like, Gabe. Oh, okay. He owns the company. All right. Right. He's right. like, I want to fly to Portland and have lunch with you. <laughs> so. Okay. I'm like, okay. I'll have lunch right. with you. Picking up the tab. All right. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. So we'll have lunch. I'm still playing hard to get. I'm like, no, nah, you know, hardware is really hard. Like it's a different DNA for a hardware oh, company. Right. Like if you want to do this, it's going to be a big lift and it's probably a cultural shift for you to do this. Mm-hmm. And he's like, well, just fly up to Seattle and get to know us. Just come up on this day. It's not an interview, um, which was a total lie. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I'll fly up. I-, I fly up there and they put me in a panel interview with Gabe in there too, <laughs> which again, I guess I loved it. let's go. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And they're like, Hey, you want to make a game controller? How would you do it? And I'd be like, Oh, I'd go to this factory. Tyne yeah, M. They're great. They can do like rapid tooling and you know, they have distribution like, yeah. Yeah. You know, Whatever, and it's just rapid fire. And then Gabe probably did something with his nose or something, tapped his nose, and like a bunch of people got up and left. And then Gabe's like, Come with me. And he took me to the fourth floor of the skyscraper there. And they're like, This whole fourth floor will be yours. You can just hire all your cohorts. You know, we'll stay out of your way. Just do your own thing. This is your little playground. Build your own thing. Yeah. Talked about the Valve way, which sounded refreshing. Yeah, and, they do things differently, which is interesting and cool. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I'm like, I don't know. And he's like, just stay another day. And of course, I flew up just for the afternoon. And he's like, I'm like, I don't, I can't stay. I got to go back. I have no toiletries or anything. He's like, ah, oh, the, the front desk will take care of it for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, was your valve shirt and the, your, your valve no, toothbrush? That's, a, that's exactly they. Like the really lovely people at the front desk took me to the swag cabinet got me a valve <laughs> shirt and then they took me off to like some store to get toiletries and underwear right. and would, put me up in like super fancy hotel then i came back yeah. the next day i'm like okay well they're gonna do the hard press again and i show up there hr person's just like you just wander around just go yeah like go talk to people have, or just yeah we have no agenda for you so I'm wandering through cabals. I'm like, what are you guys doing? Oh, Dota 2? I haven't played it. What's it all about? And <laughs> Team Fortress 2? Oh, oh okay. Yeah. That's in Oh, this is a cool place. And, you know, kind of lured me in. Yeah. yeah. But I'm still doing this other project. At the time, I'm like, I can't drop these people. And Valve was like, maybe we could just buy your time away from them. I'm like, no, I won't do, oh, <laughs> won't do that. Right. I'll work contract for you until i finish this other project but anyway it was pretty magical um i got to start recruiting folks into valve and what time was um, this what it was like 2010 2012 2010 i think yeah 2010 i think okay somewhere around there but oh this is the mandate that gave 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 me he said at the time microsoft windows 8 was coming out or it was imminent and there was the Metro interface on it. And the Metro interface did not allow any third-party stores. And the fear Valve had was that if the Metro interface took off, they would have no place to have their Steam platform. Oh. So our goal, he's like, we need to get into the living room. My vision is that gamers are very siloed right now. There's like, hardcore gamers and casual gamers and non-gamers and people that used to play games. Mm. Like, I think the living room should be the focal point for games. So just like, go explore everything. You have a basically unlimited budget, figure out how to make gaming like palatable to the whole family and make it steam platform, the centerpiece of that, which is just okay. coming from a toy background. It's just like, Oh, this is my jam. <laughs> Try right, to figure right. out how to get everyone playing. Yeah, to get people. But yeah, around. we got to hire yeah. really great people, and um, the first couple of years we just did fundamental research. And of course, Valve had you know kind of infrastructure there, which was really cool. They had you know game designers and level designers and just raw 
coders and uh, they had psychologists on board that had all kinds of ideas of like how we could measure how fun and engaging things wow. are. So Interesting. We, uh, and then Gabe is a uh, knife aficionado and at his house, mm. he was decking out his own machine shop to make his own custom knives. So he was, yeah, I'm like, I went to Gabe, I'm like, can I make a machine shop? And he's like, we're going to make the world's best machine shop. <laughs> and like, he's just so into it. Right. Uh, he even, there was a point where it's a skyscraper. And he's like, I'm just going to buy the bottom floor of the um, parking garage. And we're going to turn that into the machine shop. So <laughs> With like, ventilation he, going out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, they print money. It's like kind right. of a Yeah, steam prints environment. money. Yeah. And yeah. so like they were bringing in like city people to evaluate if we could turn the parking garage. Of course, they're like, Oh my God, like you're going to want to have solvents and oils and right. machines down here. Like you're right. going to no ventilation. Yeah. Yeah. So like they bought some giant building just a short drive away and we made this like amazing machine shop. It was so funny. I came from like so many startups where every penny counts, you know, and right. at one point, one of the mechanical engineers we brought in, he's like, I'd like a plastic press for doing injection molding. I'm like, those things are a half million dollars. That's it's a little excessive for kind of a fun thing to have. Like mm-hmm. right. Half million dollars. Yeah. He's like, I think it'll be valuable. Turned out it wasn't valuable. But we went to Gabe about it. And Gabe's like, hold on a second. He looked at his watch. Okay, we can afford it. <laughs> <laughs> like it's just wacko land when it comes to like spending. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's um, wild. Yeah, <laughs> but the recruiting process was brutal to get into Val. That was our biggest challenge. It oh. took us a long time to get people that had the Valve culture. Like mm-hmm. they have a very specific thing in their mind. Well, maybe it's not specific, but a concept in their mind, concept yeah. of a plan in their mind of what might be a Valve person and. You know, the fir- in the morning, like when we were interviewing a candidate, it would be all like technical. And then mm-hmm. there was actually the most important interview, which was the lunch. That's where an old timer would take the candidate out and see if they had kind of the valve culture. Okay. How so? It's very nebulous. It's hard okay. to describe. Yeah. Valve, when it works well, works amazingly well. And when it doesn't work, it's a complete disaster. And it's because they, the Valve way is like everyone should be able to do what's right for the customer and do what's right for um, the company. Mm-hmm. And anyone within the company is free to move anywhere. Yeah, so about that. It's not really true. But, you know, I didn't see anyone from Steam support going and working on a game. So... Right. Yeah. So, they, they would find their way out the door really quick if they moved out of their swim lane. But yeah. Anyway, that's what they say. Right. And so there's probably a thousand dimensions they're looking at you during lunch, try to figure out like if you're kind of the right cultural fit. And you know, it was super frustrating. They come back from lunch and like, I just don't know if this is a valve person. Right. Even though they have all the skills you're looking for and all those kind of things, are like, uh, they're not quite valve enough or something. Yeah, actually, here's a great example. We had a machinist and we interviewed him and the whole team's like, this guy is perfection for us. Like, just all the right skills, but he didn't have the valve dimensions to him. And so they're like, we can't hire this guy. Like, what if he leaves the machine shop and wants to play a game or work on a game? And it's like, he's not. He's a machinist. He's going to be five minutes down the road in the machine shop and he has no desire to. And they're like, nope, nope, can't hire him. They're like, well, maybe um, can we bring him on as a contractor? Yeah. So we convinced the guy to come on as a contractor. And so he's doing a great job for us. You know, four or five months into it, he came to me and he's like, I feel like a second class citizen. Like, I want to be an employee. I just, you know, right. all this extra work you're putting me through having to be a contractor. No benefits and stuff like that. Right. So I, I took it all the way to Gabe and just couldn't make any progress and just like, you know, their attitude was like, he should feel, you know, 
joyous that he gets to work at Valve on such exciting projects and gets paid so well. And it was not about money at all. He was paid well oh, right. and he quit. So, yeah, I had one of the, the folks at Valve, one of the old timers describe Valve as um, we're all lead guitarists with no drummer. And yeah, you know, <laughs> well, there's no producers there, right? Isn't that the story too? Like Valve has no producers. Like there's no one hurting the cats or so I've heard. Yeah. Right? That's yeah. the biggest problem. Like Gabe actually signals to the company many times what he wants the company to do by just going straight to the press. So, and the other way he signals is he sits in the area where he wants people to you know, gravitate to and, mm-hmm. and focus on. So he spent like three years sitting right next to me in the hardware lab, just oh. emphasizing like, this is important. Right. Here it is. I'm here. But we would be there like, you know, working on things. And we thought we had a clear direction. We're making projections and we have the outside analysts coming through and like, this is the product we want to make. And then all of a sudden Gabe would go have a press junket and all of a sudden, like, he's like, we're doing this orthogonal thing. And yeah, it's like, like, I guess we're doing that now. Right. We just pivoted. Uh, didn't see that coming. Okay. So it's kind of like navigating, like, well, we got to, like, you know, do the Gabe thing, which could be good, could be bad. But we also have this other thing that seems right. really good. Right. So, so very yeah. chaotic. Right. So did you leave there or, or how did that kind of evolve? So here, this talking about the Valve culture, and this kind of leads up to my departure from Valve. So, you know, we spent all this time doing this research, and we started to really separate out into groups, cabals, doing stuff. So the way Valve works is someone kind of rises to lead an effort. And um, the way you get engineers is you need to recruit them from other teams. And you Mm -hmm. might see how this could be problematic. So say I need a programmer and I go to the Dota 2 team and I'm like, hey, we're doing great things down in hardware. We really could Yeah, come join us. Yeah, yeah. Right. Boom. I pull them off the Dota 2 team or insert whatever team there. Right. All of a sudden I've made an enemy of whoever's kind of coordinating what's going on up there. Right. That's when things get really backstabby inside of Valve. Oh. So they may come and steal one of your people to go to whatever the game is and or trash talk you yeah. and the, you know like why are we wasting our time on hardware it's stupid and oh, i, I right. and super like rumor mill stuff like oh i overheard jerry like saying that team fortress 2 is dumb and like how unvalve is that i mean that <laughs> something but you know yeah 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 but uh so you know we're starting to try to productize things and things are getting really contentious and i actually went to gabe and had lunch with him i'm like gabe i am getting beat up like crazy like what do we do and he's like all the best things that have ever happened at valve have been led by a handful of people with arrows sticking out of their back that's exactly what he told me so Mm. frustrating (laughs) he's like if you think it's the right thing just keep doing what you're doing right but what we had kind of divided up into um, at the time is there was a Linux effort, which you know now is part of uh, the Steam Deck, which is yeah, awesome. handheld, yeah, yeah, which I heard great things about. There was a refresh of the uh, UI and interface for Steam, so big picture, which was you know kind of handy for Steam yeah. Deck, but a big flop when it got deployed to Steam. Mm-hmm. There was the Steam boxes. Mm-hmm. Um, there was the game controllers. And right. then there was a VR and AR effort. And so part of the mandate that Gabe gave me was like, you got to bring the whole family together. And so as much as I liked kind of the concept of VR, it just didn't fit the mandate. And so I was excited about augmented reality. And I've had the bug for group augmented reality gaming ever since. And that's what we do at Till 5. And right. actually the technology that we're selling in our product came from Valve. I bought it from them. Mm. Wow. So um, everything came to a head one day. Um, there was some kind of uh, trying to be politically correct here. Um, there were some people in the company pitching stuff over to Oculus. Oh. Right. And I did not get along with them. I thought that was bad. Mm-hmm. You know, and they were hardcore VR folks working on the VR effort. 
And I'm like, no, our mandate, fun games, holograms popping out of the table. Holy shit. Right. That was my family in the living room or something like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Mom can put her hands out there and push the lemmings off the cliff. Like here, try it. It's fun. Everyone had fun. Um, Mm. So um, anyway, I show up at work and like one of our mechanical engineers storms out of the elevator and he's like, did you hear what they did to Ed? I'm like, what they fired him today. I'm like, Ed's my mechanical engineer. Like why did they fire him? Which people got randomly fired all the time. And it was super opaque why they got fired. And it was usually like, well, they didn't really fit in and it was whatever. Yeah. Okay. So I'm mad and I go upstairs and it's just like someone had pulled a pin on a grenade and threw it in the middle of the entire, like everything up there. Yeah. Um, and everyone's just huddled in little circles. And I'm like, what happened to Ed? And they're like, he got fired and you're getting fired too. I'm like, what? <laughs> and six months prior, uh, Gabe Newell fire, uh, flies everyone to Hawaii for this extravagant vacation for friends and family of mm-hmm. battle. Right. And he had me come up on stage and said, Jerry's the number one hire that we've ever made. And like... Like, I'm like, I'm golden and now I'm fired like six months later. Right. Like, the these still things don't on. compute. Yeah. The weirdest layoff I've ever been involved with. They're like, um, you know, I've been on workforce reduction before. It's like you get there and like there's someone at the door and like, give us your key. Oh, you know, right, go yeah, home. Yeah. We'll let you come back here. Yeah. Or we'll- come back the next day. The orange crates are there. Yeah. I've been through some, some of those. Yeah. No, this is like, no, no, uh, just check your calendar. And uh, Valve has this rule, which I like a lot. If you hire them, you fire them. So there was an invite to go meet Gabe at like way late in the afternoon. I'm like, what am I supposed to do? Yeah, yeah. Am I going to get, yeah, it sounds like it's going to happen. What? Yeah. And, so show up and get fired. And the another weird thing is I had an interview to hire someone that day. Right. And so I'm going to people <laughs> like, who's going to run the interview? And they're like, we, we don't have anyone. Like, can you do the interview? I'm like, Hey, if you're finding this interesting, please click the like and subscribe button. So the YouTube algorithms know, and I can help spread the show. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Come work for me. I may not be here tomorrow. Come work for me. <laughs> I have to say it was my most lackluster <laughs> right. interview. Yeah. Oh, my God. So like, weird. Yeah. Okay. Whatever. Yeah. Good. Yeah. yeah I think thanks. They're, yeah. they're a 10 out of 10. You should hire them. Right. All right. right. Aces. Hire that person. <laughs> yeah. And then we went out and drank a bunch at lunch and whatever. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, and it was weird. It was also like vultures. Like people were grabbing oscilloscopes and computers off my desk. Oh, and okay. Fired. I'm like, this is weird. Right, right. <laughs> the body's not cold. Can you get out of here, please? Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> it's crazy town. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I go up to see Gabe and I'm like all morning and afternoon. I'm just like, I'm going to lay into him. Right. And I go, go up there and like I say a couple of aggressive words. You know, as I walk in the door, like, you know, whatever. And then, like, break down in tears at one point. Like, we got a good thing going. Like, how could you kill this project? And mm-hmm. anyway, Gabe said some really nice things. And as I was walking out the door, I'm like, you just can't kill that project. You should just sell it to me. And he's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, really? Oh, okay. I'm like, wow. Okay. But then the HR department had to go see them. And so I'm in the office the entire time and I'm hearing the exit packages people are getting and it's quite good. And I'm like, yeah, I'm excited about this exit package. Show me the money. Yeah. So I go there and it's like a third of what other people were getting. And I'm like, what? Yeah. I started this thing. What the heck? Yeah. And they're like, well, we took in consideration people's family situation. I mean, probably totally illegal to be saying this to family situations and things like this. And oh, I'm that's like, Oh, that's like, what do you know about my yeah, like, yeah. private life, private? Like you, you don't know my situation. It's bullshit. They're like, well, you know, just sign the paper and it's yours. It's just free money. Just take it. Like you're in high demand. You'll just be somewhere, especially after valve. And they have this. Yeah. Right. Like, oh, the valve, halo over you, you after valve. Anywhere. Right. Uh, 
I'm like, no, like I want something on par with, and they're like, I'm not signing it. And they're like, totally confused. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone else, signed. Everyone else got two thirds uh, shit ton more money than I did too. You know, it, it was super hell? weird. It was just all over the place for people, and line was yeah. super low, so it pissed me off. Right. So um, I go and I take. I brought a bunch of my pinball collection over to the valve offices, and it was super popular. People would come play all the time on the machines on the fourth floor. Mm. So I'm like, they can't be wearing out my pinball machines if they're firing right. me. Yeah, yeah. So I went and disabled all the pinball machines by setting the the head boxes down so you couldn't play except the one pinball machine that was a little controversial that caused a little bit of a schism which was a female bodybuilding pinball machine that just Mm. had a big muscle-bound woman on it okay because on that floor we also had the gym so i thought it was appropriate to have the pinball (laughs) machines with the bodybuilding yeah so i'm like you can play hard body okay right but i took a picture and posted on twitter like got fired today and then just a picture of all the pinball machines Mm -hmm. and then immediately all the press started reaching out to me and and part of this exit agreement is you can't talk about your time at valve i'm like well screw them right i didn't sign anything right yeah yeah right i didn't sign the paperwork yeah this is what it's like in valve love parts of it hate parts of it and behind the curtain yeah the hr people are freaking out like the next day they're like what are you doing and like, <laughs> come sign this and stop talking. And I'm like, that's what you want. I, I don't want that. Screw yeah. you. <clears throat> For so little money, my story is more important. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I just kept talking about Valve and like revealing like kind of what it's like. It's good and it's bad. And uh, mm. uh, what was cool is I was getting all these emails from various folks in the company. Some were like, what are you doing? The kool-aid drinkers and the others were like high five it's about time someone addressed some of the dysfunction around here Mm, interesting yeah meanwhile with the lawyers who are like an hr that are trying to get me to do this exit agreement yeah i'm also negotiating buying the technology Mm, super awkward yeah (laughs) (laughs) they're not very receptive to that idea after you're torching other shit so they're like yeah burned the bridges yeah salted the earth right right so yeah it made i mean i was in and out of the valve offices for like you know first i had to get a ton of stuff a lot of my personal equipment and pinball machines were there pinballs aren't easy to move yeah i mean i decked out the lab with personal equipment and stuff just so we could get going yeah. So I was just in and out of there for like a couple months, you know, mm-hmm. just dealing with business. And it was kind of fun, like some people glowering at me and others like, we really miss you here. It's like really super right. surreal and bizarre. Right. Anyway, I'm rambling a bunch, but that valve mm-hmm. was really interesting. It, I think overall it was very positive. And, mm-hmm. and in general, I've, I've dissed on Valve here in this talk, but I think in general, the thing I like about Valve is... In their hearts, they do try to do the right thing for the customer. And that's kind of one of their mantras. And they screw up a lot, but it's always good intention. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Yeah. It's funny. uh, Gabe and I are both on this 50 over 50 list that came out in 2019 of the game industry. And I'm like... can't be 50. Oh, I'm way north of 50. <clears throat> and I was like, yeah, yeah, you know, me and Gabe, except he's got six yachts, which is six more yachts than I have. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, we, you know, we're tight. Um, yeah, it was kind of cool. And, and I worked with an engineer at Wide Load Games, which was Disney, and, and he's, I think he's still at Valve's, and that was like 2010 when Disney came in and nuked our studio. Um, and we drank a lot of lunch, and then, yeah. Next day, uh, if you can ever get someone from Valve to take you to lunch, like they just give you a credit card when you join, and there's just no restrictions on it. So it's like, oh, you just want to go to the steakhouse? Like, is that what you're feeling? Okay, let's take <laughs> you to the steakhouse and rack up a thousand dollar lunch. Yeah, just you know, anything to recruit card. people in and like make yeah. them feel happy. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Not too many years ago, I had Gabe out, um, which was really cool. Gabe had not seen what we were working on. It was very difficult at times to get Gabe to like take the time because he was playing Dota 2 all the time when I was there. <laughs> right. He came in. We got to actually let him try our system, a multiplayer AR system. We played a bunch of games. And he, he turned to me. He's like, Jerry, this is what you were talking about. Wow. And he's like, when you want to raise money, give me a call. 
And I'm like, oh, great. I, this is music to my ears being in a startup. Duh. Of course, when it came time, I've, it's really hard to reach Gabe. I'm just like pinging him like, hey, yeah. we're raising money. We're raising right. money. <laughs> you want to help us raise? You've got big checks. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you're at Tilt 5 now, and, and you, because I was on the website, you built this platform, right? And um, you wear you have the glasses and the controller, and you sit around a table and it's tabletop and stuff like that. Yeah, there was actually a small event between. So bought the technology from Valve. VR is riding a hype cycle like no other at the time. Like Pretty six, 15, 16, 17, something like that? Yeah, around that time frame. Oculus had done like a really good Kickstarter, and they were in negotiations to like get acquired. Half of the Valve team, like here's my... Uh, spoiled grapes kind of uh, moment <laughs> like half the team that was lobbying to get rid of the ar folks had went over to oculus like oh, oh. You, oh. yeah destroyed here so that we can take it yeah that's bullshit yeah yeah yeah, yeah. like oh i tossed all our technology to them and then went over yeah um, but anyway things were really hot and i had taken this technology out of valve and we did a kickstarter which was quite good um even though you know it was pretty hastily put together and then we raised fifteen million dollars from Andy Rubin, um, mm. founder of I've heard that Google Android. Oh yeah, Google you may know companies. more from his scandals recently, but oh. we were unaware of that back then. Mm. He piled all this money onto us, and I got scared. Like I'm too. I've never done a venture back startup, but I've run businesses and run teams, and I don't right. know why I was scared, but I. Like had hired in this external kind of startup CEO who was quite good. And then we raised all this money. And then Andy Rubin and his team, they're the moonshot kind of people. They're like, mm. go from zero to, you know, a billion dollars overnight. Right. Right. Just spend the money and go as fast as you can. And our CEO is like, I don't even know how to spend this money as fast as you want us. And we can't <laughs> ship a million units the first year. It would cost me $250 million in financing. And Right. And he's like, we'll get you the $250 million in financing. Just execute and just complete chaos. Yeah. And they pushed out my CEO. I found myself like parked in a corner and they brought in some Disney and Sony executives and they burned through the $15 million so fast. <laughs> it was incredible. Right. Like, Bring I those think it was folks less in. than a year. Yeah. Gone. Yeah. I, I work with Disney folks and other. Yeah. I, I can see that happening. Yeah. Okay. I actually had this yelling match with the CEO that one of the multiple CEOs that they brought in. It was funny. They kept bringing CEOs in that they were unhappy with the previous one and then get happy with the new one and bring another one in. And one of the Disney guys um, was a yeller. So, and I haven't, you know, yell at me, I'll yell back. So we're having right. this. Right. I'm pretty chill normally, but. Uh, <laughs> but you're yelling at me, this, yeah yelling match over the stupidest thing like we were trying to do some projections of like how big the opportunity could be and he's like i'm sick and tired of all these like flat business plans i miss my days at disney and i would just sit in my office do nothing and people would just bring me charts and i would just choose the one that had the most up and to the right uh, <laughs> i what a tool <laughs> oh my goodness Wow. The funny thing is, every time they brought in a new CEO, they had to rebrand the company. So there was just like wow. half a million dollars at one point just went out the door for a rebranding. Got Deutsch, one of the like oh. premier like brand yeah. agencies. So ridiculous. Yeah, those people can burn through money. Yeah, websites and branding. Yeah, it's half it's millions. The most like that. Mind melting stuff. I actually keep one of the books around here. They made this nice book. Like, mm -hmm. um, at this point, we already had like our industrial design kind of figured out: soft curve, white, you know, relatable uh -huh. to women, men, young, old. Like the design language was there, but we had this new CEO that wanted to rebrand everything and. You get sucked into these long meetings where they're like drum circling and burning <laughs> incense or whatever. <laughs> and they come back and do the big presentation and they're flipping through this book and like every page has like something like ridiculous on it, like a bunch of almost stock photos mm. of like we could go angular with like 
aggressive words or in like, the end your design language is bubbles soft curve soft colors and i'm like like is this a reality show is this somebody like filming this and i'm not supposed to laugh like what is going on here i wish i could have recorded it, it was straight out yeah. of the show silicon valley well, that's what i'm saying too silicon valley yeah that, that's exactly what i was thinking when you're describing this i'm like that's... It's funny. Actually, Silicon Valley made me cry because a lot of this like nonsense was happening about the time that that show was airing. Mm. And it was so hard on me to just see like this thing. Right. I was so passionate about evaporating. Hitting home. Yeah. And it's just like they just kept hitting like these drum beats of stupid stuff that happens. Wow. But yeah, it was funny. I another yelling match ensued because um, after all of the uh, drum circle people left. Um, <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. If you're in that space, I actually do enjoy it. But it's like, yeah, but not for work. At the right, right time. Yeah, yeah, right. The right situation. Right. Highly focused. You right. know, just not open ended. Yeah. Anyway, I took the book and I there was a trash can at the door and I just dropped it in the door. I'm like, we might as well, and however many hundreds of thousands, we might as well have just put that money in here and set it on fire, which then the CEO followed me out and just started yelling in front of everybody. <laughs> it's like so many stories. I mean, I could go on wow. about these stories, but yeah. uh, anyway, everything imploded and a group of us actually like the core team. I'm like, this is the team we need. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I, everyone agreed I should be the CEO. And we actually bought the, the technology and then started a company. Very interesting. I made a crater in the ground, like millions of dollars in the ground. I had to go raise money, uh, which was difficult after you know, yeah. doing that. But we slowly built up the company. We finished off. There were some directions we had been taken on the hardware, which was just not right. We fixed that and just got a lot of strategic investors. like. Mm-hmm. You know, companies that you know need us to exist that are that understand like you know you don't go from zero to the moon in right right one shot we did a very pragmatic it took us like a couple years of just like small doses of money to get the first like you know product kind of like we could take it and show it to the world yeah prototypes or you know or yeah and then i found myself in this situation where i couldn't raise money i just kind of all yeah. of the seed money was gone. I was in this awkward position where we needed more like $7 million, what we ultimately ended up raising. And it was this Goldilocks zone where, mm. you know, I just couldn't find investors. And we had this one investor. He's like, just go do a Kickstarter. And Kickstarters are terrible in so many ways. So the first Kickstarter we did at uh, Cast AR, which is my first company. Um, I feel very fortunate we were able to refund everyone's money when Andy Rubin's guys came through and just completely changed the direction mm. of the product. And so I got out of having thousands of angry people because uh, they got their money back. So they were got their money back and even like shoo, dodged a bullet there. That's the worst thing is you raise money, but you never have enough money to develop what you're raising right. it for. Yeah. And I had swore I'll never do a Kickstarter again because it's so stressful having a th- thousands of people angry at you all the time. It keeps you up at night, right? Yeah. So we had this investor lined up for this money that we need. And they're like, if you do a Kickstarter, then we're definitely in for this. Hmm. And we were like really low on money at the time. Like we had under 100000 in the bank. Asked everyone in the company, will you furlough for one month so we can do this? That's not technically correct. We actually started priming it three months in advance, but we knew Mm. we were going to have under a hundred thousand. Like, will you furlough while we run the campaign? And if it's successful, right? Then then we continue. We pull the plug and we gave it a go. Um, Knocked it out of the park on, you know, raised a couple million dollars. Then went back to the investors, Mm. like, okay, check this out. AR project on Kickstarter. Like, look at that. Like, just the best for the month like just eclipsed everybody and they're like ah, we really hoped you would have raised something like eight or nine million dollars and then we would have invested in like no one is doing eight or nine million right dollars yeah that's a pipe dream and why would we come to you like if we raise eight or nine million dollars we'd go we get, don't need you or find somebody home. else yeah yeah you give us like four times the money so now we were just stuck in this situation, like, great, now we have a few million bucks. Um, 
mm. not enough to get the product productized. But fortunately, I was able to just scrape and scrounge and money. And turns out being a CEO is not that difficult. It's almost the same thing as like pitching your design ideas to a team. Mm. And I think one of the biggest surprising things to me is like how close it parallels uh, what you're already doing. And like if you're an engineer, like if you have good skills at pitching concepts, you know, it's going to help you in many other places in your yeah. career. Be able to tell a story and stuff like that. Okay. So now, yeah, now, now you've got, you're the CEO, you're at Tilt 5 and it's out, right? I, I see you can buy it for 389 bucks. Yeah, get a two pack. Right, yeah, right, right yeah, to the we website. Yeah, put all our focus on like, multi-packs and stuff um it's been out for a while we're getting toward the tail end of gen uh one um mm. you know there'll be a gen two really soon um if they're compatible so if you feel like getting a great um you know price on one now you can get one now um if you yeah. don't fine there's kind of a rule of thumb that i'm breaking it right now it's called the osborne effect it's very famous if you mm. um, a company called osborne computers made a computer okay um, it was really in advanced for the time and then they released it, and then they went to the press and said, "Just wait until Osborne 2. Oh, which tanked the sales of Osborne One and bankrupted them. Yeah, can't do it too early. Yeah, okay. That's yeah, we put a, a lot of focus in the experience. So part of our goals when we designed this was I went back to like my toy days. Mm -hmm. uh, the toy guys are really good at this kind of thing. Like, know your audience. And we have a pretty broad audience, so it's hard to know the audience. But, you know, what are the friction points? Um, mm. How can you remove things from the product to get kind of the same effect, right? So okay. it's what you leave out of products that's important, and especially if it removes friction points. And so mm. there's a lot of things about our product is, like, they're see-through, and they have really big lenses. They look a little dorky because they're giant, but you don't feel claustrophobic. You can right. see the eyes and your friends. Mm -hmm. They fold open like glasses. There's no ratchets or any adjustments. Yeah, just, or, yeah, headbands and all that shit. Yeah, they're all like like a toy. They're made. It's all plastic, so they're mm. uh, indestructible almost. Mm -hmm. And yeah, let me see. Yeah, yeah. Just, and our goal was slip them on. 10 seconds to your experience. And so that's what we basically achieve is you right. slip it on and holograms start popping out of the table. And then right. also when it comes to a uh, multi-user, like people sitting around a table, mm -hmm. you know, should fully understand exactly what they're seeing and how it relates to the other people. So we put a lot of work into that. Then okay. when it comes to the game engines, Unity, Unreal, and Godot, uh, we've made some fabulous tools for multi-user AR experiences. So that's my co-founder's hmm. claim to fame. He's a tools guy. Okay. So his rule of thumb is if there's something difficult, you know, to do inside the game engine, see if we can make a, a tool, ideally drag and drop. And so uh -oh. folks that have worked with our tools and our SDK are like, holy cow, all I had to do is just drag and drop your package into my game and it just started rendering on the table. Hmm. Like just immediately. That's and cool. like, if I wanted to hook something up to the wand, I just drag a game object onto it. And there it is. It's attached to the end of the right. wand. So, so, so you're saying you can develop a game in any of those three engines and it will run on your hardware. Yeah. Huh? Uh, we have some exciting updates coming. Our next driver release will let you do open XR so you can run VR games. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I failed to describe our system too. And this is part of like, how do you minimize a system to hit a price point and ease of use? We actually have this kind of fold out game board, which is part of the optics. So the okay. light from the glasses goes to the game board and then back again, which makes it very comfortable to look at. It gives right. us super wide field of view and the user right. understands like holograms are here. This is and the play field. Like it's, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Okay. Makes it easy for the developer too. So there's gizmos inside the game engine. So if you have an existing game, you just mm -hmm. drag our plugin in and then you see a game board show up and it's like, Oh, well this, you know, mm -hmm. whatever building is going to be popping up out of the table because I can right. see it right in the game engine. It's like, well, it's too big. So you just scale the size of the game board. And now, you okay. know, now you can see more. You know, like if you have a character running around, 
Mm -hmm. and you want that character to be able to run through a bigger scene, you just make the game board game object a child of the the player. And and now as the player moves, it drags the game board through the scene. And so your player stays kind of locked in the middle of the table. Oh, right. Anywhere. Because it's fixed. Okay. So, so you can assign yeah. game game boards to each player. So you can have asymmetrical views. So there's a lot of really cool things you can do. So you can do, you know, visibility per player. Like the obvious one is UI for each player is just on its own layer and only player one can see theirs and player two. And it's yeah. Just yeah, yeah. Kind of drop down menus to make that happen. Right. Or different game boards. So you can have players just running into a big universe anywhere they want and then they can join up and move mm-hmm. apart from each other that's so, interesting anyway. yeah and, and there's a lot of people who are game devs and indie game devs that listen and watch the show and you know stuff like that so like you know if, if someone's got an idea or there's like is it a publishing platform like like let's say i, I and two other people want to make a game like what is the process for that like how do we do that do we sign up you get the sd sdk kit and that kind of stuff or like how does it work um, it's all free, uh, so you just go download it, you okay. know, and drag it into Unity or Unreal, and and you're good to go. And as far as publishing, we don't restrict where you're gonna where you um, publish to, so you can put it on Steam or you know any okay. platform you want. We also support Android, so hmm. you can put your your games on Android devices. Uh, if you want us to help you cross promote, you know, our you know part of our software, you know, we can promote games. So oh, okay, yeah, so. Like, is there a store and then it's like you get like premium placing for promotion and all that kind of stuff like in this in the headset or no, no store currently. No but store. OK, we do do use it for promotional activities. And, you know, if if there's a game that you might have that really fits well on our system, we have the ability to help fund bringing it over to our system. So I'm happy to talk to you guys about, you know, anyone oh. about that. Okay. You know, no puzzles, please. We have way too many puzzles in the pipeline. But <laughs> right, tapped out of that. But yeah, other stuff. No. Oh, Someone that can get me a command and conquer style game. That's what I really want. Oh wow, a little C and C. Yeah, I remember yeah. that. Westwood and all those folks. Yeah. Okay. So you know, here in 2024, like, what advice would you give someone looking to get into gaming or toys or, or things like that? Yeah, it's tough right now. The unfortunate thing about Silicon Valley is they chase the latest shiny, which is right. AI. And, right. you know, we're already starting to see, you know, the um, gravestones of lots of AI companies coming and going. And mm-hmm. um, I think having worked in with companies in Silicon Valley and a really good place to go is there's a thing called the Gardner hype cycle. That's too MBA, like I guess to talk about, but mm. um, there's on the, the hype cycle, there's a big spike. Like we're in the AI spike right now. Okay. And lots of companies are formed and then they die really fast. And there's this trough of delusionment, like after people realize like, Oh, maybe it's not going to be a trillion dollar business overnight. Right. And then there's the long tail. Yeah, long tail. I'm very familiar with that. Yeah, that's where long lasting companies, you know, time and time again, come out of it. And it's like choosing projects or companies to go to. I would look at the long tail companies. Um, Mm -hmm. And anyway, Gardner um, publishes this, and you can kind of look where different technologies and um, are on that. So that'd be my first piece of advice. Um, But if you want to be just right in the mix and the froth of it, just grab something on the hype cycle and go for it. Certainly done those. Yeah. chaos and fun and and just don't be disappointed when your company evaporates uh yeah a right. year later right just uh, go, for, go for the ride knowing that that's going to happen at some point yeah as far as like toys and video games that's a tough one um you know i stay in close contact with my toy friends that market's been kind of dumped on its head uh right now there's mm. there's a lot of companies trying to innovate there but I think they're finding themselves uh, edged out a tiny bit by video games. Okay. Uh, maybe that's coming back because we're seeing things like board games are kind of exploding. Yeah, totally. Uh, on yeah, the yeah. Scene. I think maybe video games, people are a little tired of the same old right. genre of game coming out again. Yeah. Yeah, the rinse and repeat stuff. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, talking to the toy guys, you know, they're kind of hunkering down into like their evergreen products. Oh, uh, right. Right. It, right. It, it's very price sensitive, right? It is very much like 20 bucks. It's, get it in that box. And I don't care what you do. It's got to, it's got to fit that $20 price point, right? It's very skew driven and just price. Yeah. Sensitive. And distributions in shambles right now, uh, brick yeah. and mortars right, struggling. Right. Like we even see that in the video game space. Like why am I forgetting their name? Uh, meme stock. Oh, uh, game stock. Game, game stock. Game, like, GameStop. Even game, yeah. Even game stops having to like pivot around, like they're doing board games and miniatures and they're trying to find their way through like, how does, brick and mortar survive and and toys right. were very brick and mortar like you want the kids to go in yeah toys are us and see it and you know and all that it's just gone so it's gone and like amazon is tough uh environment yeah they're very it's very cutthroat um i'm terrified for the video game space right now i mean just look what's happening with embracer you know oh god free, yeah. yeah free money dried up for them and right just spending spree without even thinking about the consequences and just, yeah, it was like a land grab and it's like, yeah, I know a lot of folks over there. They're really great people. I think they're getting like a lot of hate, um, maybe unjustly, but I mean, interest rates went up, the money disappeared. Right. That's what I talk about. Yeah. A loan at 2%, a loan at 7% is two very different things. And they're like, we're screwed now. And yeah, I, I know a lot of just people over, that have been over their skis. Yeah. They're way over their skis. And yeah, unfortunately, it almost makes me cry. Like I know yeah. a couple game studios that are over there and it's just like, Oh, it's just yeah. such bad timing. Oh yeah. I, I know I have friends that are impacted at lost boys interactive. Right. And, um, you know, that was at 400. Now it's down like a hundred and change 130, something like that because of embracer, you know, and just sucks people got too greedy um yeah and yeah. to think of the consequences um i don't know if anyone's been around the game industry for a while like you know the game industry is pretty tough business like mm-hmm. entire studios like riding high and then they just evaporate overnight like how yeah. many times is warner gonna spin something up and then just toss it aside yeah Oh. Yeah, yeah, and Disney's notorious for that too. They they they, they license their IP and like, man, we can make a lot more money if we just keep it all inside and, and and we get all the money. And then they spin up all these studios and like, damn, these burn rates are killing us. And then they contract again. And you know, I got caught in one of those in 2010. I think it was seven eight hundred people that got laid yeah. off. Um, and that wave back when they were after their acquisition phase when they contracted. I think the last thing for me, a piece of advice is I've never, uh, very rarely, I should say, I've very rarely taken projects that I'm not excited about. So no matter Mm -hmm. how they turn out, I'm never really disappointed. I quit doing types of projects when it becomes stale to me. So, you know, I've designed a chip of a particular type and you get a reputation of making that chip. And it's like, yeah, I could go like bleed this for years oh, right. you know instead i'm going to jump industries and go work on a you know aerospace navigation system or something and mm. it's like super satisfying never want to go do that again but it was super satisfying and then yeah find something else like, folks in the video game industry there's so much talent there the pressure cooker that you're always under mm. will make other industries just look like a cakewalk right like, yeah. I, I, yeah. But, Sometimes I talk to engineers in like these kind of cushy industries and they're complaining. I'm like, Oh brother, give me a break. <laughs> right, right. You go to the game industry for a crunch when you're trying to ship and, and talk go try to, to ship a toy in one year. And right. like, yeah, yeah. you have to have it on the boat to be in the stores <laughs> on Christmas. If you miss it, well, yeah, yeah. In the video game industry, used to be very much like I, I go back to the 16-bit days, right? Like I was in the hotline at the TurboGrafx 16, Ooh, right? Yeah. To date myself, and and it was very much driven, like you know, there was a window between uh, it was like Halloween to Christmas, and that was where like the bulk of the games got sold. So like you you had to have them out before then, and the inventory had to be right because like if you if you overspent, then the, the toy stores are pressing sh- discs and making yeah. cartridges. Yeah, well, it was cartridges Hue back cards. then, the Hue cards, yeah, and all that. Um, but then if you if you underestimated, the, the lead times were so long that by the time 
you could get them manufactured and shipped back. You know, or, it was or out. Nintendo jumps in there and uh, takes all of the allocation for themselves. And oh yeah, yeah, that too. Yeah, yeah. Nintendo <laughs> would first party. Nintendo's about Nintendo. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it was it was cutthroat. Going back to uh, Gabe, a kind of interesting story there. I mean, we live in a really cool time where you can ship a game. It's double-edged sword, right? You ship a game yeah. and you can send patches out. And um, having spent so much time with Gabe and talking to him about like the early days of Steam, um, it was not obvious to them at all. And actually, there was kind of a revolt in the company when he really wanted to have the Steam platform. and. Mm. You know, my understanding, the way he described it, it wasn't necessarily to make the store that, you know, would dominate all PC sales. Right. He just wanted to end piracy, like, for their games. Oh, okay. And everyone was mad. They were low on money. And they're like, he had bought an entire company, brought it in. And then they ended up firing all of them, or most of them. Mm -hmm. And then he just kept insisting. They ended up building it. And uh, all these other game companies were like, they just went to him like, hey, it's just a thing. You can just try it. Electronic Arts, just stick a couple games on here and you'll see that, you know, piracy's, you know, down. And, yeah, you know, all of a sudden they had this platform that where all the customers were. and Right. And they're taking you know, 30% for every dollar, right? So Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then later EA's like, oh, I want to do EA Origin. And it's like. Too bad all the customers are over at Steam, right. this thing that just kind of lucked together. Yeah, and it just keeps growing, right? Like, it, it is, you know, the place to go. And I remember piracy being a big deal, too, right? Like, that was, and you put stuff on your discs to try and, you know, yeah. beat it and all that kind of stuff. But then it would, it could cripple the game and, like, it would cause problems, too, because it was too aggressive. Then people who paid for the games, there would be weird oddities with, like, connecting or whatever. So it was just such a, terrible thing to deal with um but yeah I, I have huge admiration for you since you were you know got your start where you had to have extreme discipline because you bake it into that cartridge you yeah know, you're going to spend millions of dollars on cartridges and there's yeah. no going back no it's um, it's in that yeah yeah i, I worked on abuse and butted um cartridges on the 16-bit days and just we were just killing ourselves because we knew like what went on that cartridge to you know sega and nintendo that was going to come out for christmas and there was no updates it was on the cartridge and it was on the roms right like you'd have your roms you put them in the little easy bake oven and uh, <laughs> wipe them out and then reprogram them and hand them out to qa and and that whatever went out there went to the manufacturers and a couple months later then it was in this the stores and um uh, yeah that was terrifying now we have the the other side of the the sword where uh half big stuff goes out now, now that i'm in like management of like a whole company i feel the pressure though like mm -hmm. the folks in charge of these big triple a titles that have to get them out the door half baked like right like even our product like the initial release of it's just like we held our nose and we're like, well, we really don't like these like bugs that are in there, but <laughs> we are going to be broke if we try to get all the bugs fixed on this thing. We sent it out there and we took the black eyes for having like some janky stuff. Yeah. You have to make that choice, you know? Um, so what are you curious about right now, just in the industry around gaming and toys and video games and just like that kind of stuff? Well, I try to monitor closely kind of what the trends are. And the, the thing that's most curious for me is, you know, there's there's been kind of like through lines in the past. Like, oh, yeah, everything's kind of, you know, heading this direction in the industry. And I'm having a hard time. It's really fuzzy for me. Like, what's what's kind of tending to be hot right now? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's because I'm too busy and I can't just watch all the industry news. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's interesting to me because, like, you know, I want to understand how it can be adapted to the direction we want to go. Yeah, and your platform and stuff, yeah. Yeah, it's like, you know, I do watch toys a lot. I find it kind of interesting, like I mentioned, this retraction kind of into the evergreen products because they're having mm -hmm. trouble funding or getting attention on new innovations, which is a little sad, like... 
Yeah, that's I remember when I was a kid, probably similar to you, it's just like there were all kinds of toy gadgets that came out that had very innovative you know, oh, yeah. mechanisms, yeah. or maybe they could fit a processor in it and you could play like Tetris on a wristwatch or something. It yeah, was, all, all those things they could do with chips and just do something interesting. Yeah. Because I've been using AI a lot. I just done it just a few minutes ago, but it's been a, you know, when it comes to programming, you know, great at 6502, not so great at C sharp. Um, I've been mm -hmm. really impressed with how I can, for fun, I just use our system because it's just so fun, fun to program on the weekends. I make just really janky, terrible games on it. Yeah. And prototypes. How and stuff. Productive, I can be using like Chat GPT to write scripts for Unity. It's like mm -hmm. so good now. Like these things where I would spend 30 minutes, like, you know, going through threads on Stack Overflow, seeing people grandstand about the proper way to like sort some kind of whatever. Yeah. You yeah. Know, I can describe it to Chat GPT, and I know it's pretty terrible, but it, right. like, but it, it, it does what you need it to do. Yeah. Yeah. We have a person that works by our team because yeah. right. sometimes I, I, I make a kind of a gameplay loop that's fun. And I'm like, hey, I invented a thing that I, is pretty fun and uh, pass it off to the team. Right. And they're like, oh, God, it's full of all of this chat GPT code. <laughs> I'm like, it's always got comments. Come on. Right. And you can play it. Yeah. yeah In fact, our team, they've, mm -hmm. they've gotten, I've made so many of these really like terrible little games. They're making the Jerry torture pack. They're getting ready to re <laughs> release it. Like we have a uh, wood turning hero where uh, competitive wood turning. So what you use our turning uh, like on a lathe. Okay. It shows you the shape you have to make. And then you all sit around the table and you have to use the wand to try to mimic the shape is within 30 uh, seconds. It's, it's ridiculous. Uh, um, yeah, I did yeah. curling. Uh, so you use our wand. So you have someone's brushing while someone throws <laughs> the stone. Um, I made desert buses. So Desert Bus, which is the famous, you know, yeah. uh, Penn & Teller. Oh, you know? oh, yeah, yeah. The game were just, yeah, it's just in real time, just driving on the desert. Yeah, that one. Okay, yeah. I, I absolutely, I've always loved the concept of Desert Bus. Like, Penn & Teller were frustrated that game the games industry was, you know, in trouble in the 90s because their games were too realistic, which is so hilarious. Like, <laughs> right. Sega. Genesis was too realistic. Yeah, too realistic. Right, 16-bit. So they made this Easter egg game called Desert Bus where to get your first point, you drive from Phoenix, Arizona to Las Vegas in real time in a bus that has really bad steering. And I guess that freeway is just a straight line. There's yeah. nothing to do. I never played it, but that's exactly what I've heard. Yeah, and it was and it got a cult following. Yeah, there's come, uh, uh, groups like lo uh, Loading Ready Run that do charity and raise like hundreds of thousands of dollars for charity just playing days of desert bus. Anyway, <laughs> I made desert buses. So it's okay. a multiplayer. Plural. Yeah, there you go. Okay. And yeah, it's top down. You have to control your buses, and if two buses touch or you run into something on the side of the road, game mm. over, and you have to drive for eight hours. <laughs> anyway, just a bunch of terrible games like that. All done with Chat GPT to do most. Yeah, but, of it. but it allows you prototype and experiment. And yeah, there's a guy at work who's just really getting into it, and he's in Unreal. He's in Unity. He's teaching you how to do stuff and and from what i'm hearing it's like building stuff and like he's just super uh invested in it and it's doing some really amazing stuff like i think this continue. is like the valve days um they described how they hire certain engineers into the company and i think this is perhaps going to be you know even more important in the future with you know ai being able to assist um mm -hmm. So as they described it, there are creative people, the architects, and usually they can't code very well. Yeah. But they just brilliant at like coming up with gameplay mechanics and oh, levels right. yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. And so they hire a bunch of people like that, but then they hire like folks from financial software and you know, aerospace. These are the mm. people that really get off on like making some things, you know super robust and what they do is right. they, they invent it over here and then these people make it super robust and then uh, pass down the line ai is going to be really great for folks like myself that are uh like to say it more of the architectural level mm -hmm. you know and then be able to pass it off to folks that really know how to do it right and make it good and 
Yeah, take, take it, go take faster. it further. So, what are your thoughts? Uh, this is loaded, but like on AR, VR, MR, right? Like uh, you're probably the most qualified person ever I've had on the show to answer. I think most people agree. Like something like that is going to be useful in the future, mm-hmm. right? Uh, we all have our dreams of like you know, these displays that are as thin as your glasses that, you know, holograms are floating everywhere that you can interact with. Um, But, you know, we're dealing with uh, the laws of physics and, and optics and physics in the optical domain is more difficult to work with. And even like the physics of semiconductors, light is Mm. really hard to wrangle and, and control. And that's why we've seen like, you know, VR headsets tend to be these big bulky things just because they have to be you know, optically. And then the AR systems are, are a little underwhelming. The ones that are, have transparent lenses, you know, they're yeah. not, you know, the gr- images are pretty washed out and competing with like light coming from the outside world and small fields of view. Right. That's just physics, right? Mm-hmm. So we're going to be in that uh, realm for a long time. And that's the clever hack with our system is we, I, I made the observation, if I can just give me more space for my optics and that's why we have the special board that reflects the light back to each user it gives me all okay. the space i need to like set up the optics the way i need it so we have 110 degree field of view it's wow. very comfortable on the eyes stuff like that Good. so what i think we're gonna see is very application specific ar devices out there um okay. and i think that is I always thought AR would come first and then fully immersive like VR would come second. And I think Mm -hmm. the carts before the horse with VR, like there's a lot of people that love VR, but it's so niche. Yeah. Like you're not going to get grandma to wear a VR system. There's very few, you know. Yeah. There's all these barriers around it and price. A lot of people. So I'm anxious. uh, Like Google glass was an example. I was excited when Google glass came out. I was working at valve at the time and everyone was panicked like, Oh no, we've lost to Google. And I'm like, well, just look (laughs) at the optics on it. It's going to be this little tiny postage stamp. You know, if they market this right, it's going to be brilliant. It's going to lead the way to what we want to do. And uh, they marketed it in a terrible way. They showed people jumping out of planes and learning how to play a ukulele with it, things that couldn't even do. And like, oh, yeah, you know, if you go look at the promo videos, trying to sell the future 25 years too soon. Okay. But um, I hope we see devices that like are really small, bright price point. You pull them out, they solve a problem, pull them up, put them put away. Them right. Right. I think that's first. And then second, things are going to get better a decade from now. And then you're going to see something maybe you want to wear for extended mm-hmm. periods of time. And then, you know, and then as we solve some of these problems, like fully immersive glasses that can go between AR and VR, but it's like any industry. I collect retro computers and a lot of old things. And mm-hmm. I've never seen an industry that went from zero to perfection, you know, yeah. in a couple of years. And, you know, when talking about the Gardner hype cycle, like when VR came out, they're like, it's going to be a $3 trillion business in three years. And it's just like, why yeah. do they say this every time? It's just right. no way. Because <laughs> they shoot um, themselves in the foot. Yeah. Like eight bit computers, your home computers, like it took 30 years to make like the laptop that everyone could just like throw in their bag. Right. In the yeah, early right. days, it was this niche thing that us computer nerds like played Pac Man on and right. maybe wrote some basic. And they sold a lot of them and there was a lot of opportunity. Mm-hmm. Like, those companies made a lot of money on those to, you know, selling the dream. The computers are here and they're going to be a thing. Yeah, yeah. Most of them ended up in the closet and they yeah. got better and better and better. And then we yeah. got some killer apps. Right. From our perspective, we try to make our product closer to a toy than like some perfect device. We make a lot of compromises mm. to have that you focus. Cannot, yeah. You can't have like monsters crawling out of the ceiling on our system they just kind of pop out of the table and it's like a little square that you play on and mm-hmm. like this is your little magic square yeah, yeah but this it's is where only it happens 195 dollars a headset right mm-hmm. and it right. just works here Pick AR, right. ar somewhere instead of a gen- right. general purpose device that kind of serves nobody yeah that makes sense um anything you're playing right now you're excited about any kind of games um things you're yeah. I've been 
so bored with games. I've been going back and like revisiting Fallout 4 and Skyrim mm. and yeah. just kind of playing some of the tried and true ones again. Mm. I, I don't know how many times I've played through those games. Yeah, that's kind of it. Um, well, you're big into pinball too, right? Like, uh, uh, you have, oh, like, yeah. It, it, yeah. I'm friends with a lot of people at Stern Pinball, right? Because of sh- oh. the Chicago connection and. Uh, those some of those folks went to Midway, and I was at Midway Games at the time, and then they went back to pinball. So like George Gomez, who's oh. a friend of mine, who's awesome, awesome guy. Like you know, he did Spy Hunter, right? Like I went into interview with him. I'm just like oh. Wayne's World. Like I'm not worthy. Um, and Brian Eddy and Greg Frears and and all these pinball legends oh, awesome. are all back at Stern. It was kind of like getting the band back together again. Right. And they, they got the company came in and the private equity came in and helped them figure out the market. And they've just, you know, exploded. I walked around uh, the factory with George, I don't know, eight, nine I years ago. Keep, I can't keep up with them anymore. There was, yeah. you know, I was scared for new pinball. Like there's always a market for old pinball and yeah. like, 80 percent i i have over 80 machines and wow. I'd say like probably like 80 percent of my machines are like older you know yeah. 1990s and stuff like that adam's family and yeah, stuff oh, like yeah. That. yeah. twilight zone twilight zone yeah yeah classics um never get old mm-hmm. um i was getting kind of concerned for pinball because they were just you know in the in decline which I yeah. think a lot of industries go ebbs and flows. Maybe video games are in that right now. Maybe that's why pinball is so hot right now. People want that tangible kinesthetic feel. Mm. Board right. games are hot, you know, but yeah. Yeah. I was concerned for them. And then they started, they got this private equity. They brought a bunch of auto folks in to optimize mm-hmm. their production so that it could yeah. make them more efficiently. And I was like, great. Yeah. Oh, some really classic, great games. You got ACDC and Metallica. Yeah, Foo Fighters Davis. and Rush. And yeah. And I'm buying these things. And then, of course, <laughs> they suckered me in. Like, you don't want like the base tier. You want either the yeah, premium or the super yeah. deluxe one, which is just like only another couple thousand dollars. Right. And, <laughs> right. You're already five in. What's, what's a couple thousand more? Right? Yeah. 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 Now, now they're producing so many of these machines a year. It's like I have to remortgage the house to be able to keep <laughs> up with keep the up. number of great games they're making. Yeah, yeah, it. Um, yeah, it'll it, probably it's, saturate it's pretty... at some point. There's only so much you can. Right. Well, I think COVID also kind of fueled that, right? Because you think like people were quarantined at home and they're not going on their vacations or like sitting on this money and they have a basement. Like, well let's just play pinball, right? Like we're, we're stuck at home anyway. So that market seemed to take off and the, you know, the unboxing videos where you go on YouTube and you know, there's like that whole culture around unboxing a new pinball machine and watching people talk about it. Plus Europe, like half of their business is you know, overseas. Um, so oh, that market yeah. took off. Uh, so yeah, it's been a real Renaissance and, um, it was theory, interesting. Yeah. I started collecting pinball machines um, in the '90s when I had my computer stores, and no one wanted them. That's like, oh, and that's uh, whatever and stuff. Family for free. Someone has it. Oh, like, oh wow! I it just and I would just stick a machine in like the back room of the computer store. We had fun with it and everything. Yeah. And uh, in the early 2000s, I'm like, I don't know why people don't want these things. I do. People started importing them back in from Europe. So I got in on some of these deals where people mm. are like, we're going to get a container and we're going to oh, right. full of just, random machines. Yeah. How oh, many, random. Yeah. Just, are, wow. Grab are you in for five machines? I'm like, I'll take five random machines. And then wow. we'd have people like load up these containers and they would show up and it's like, yeah. oh my God, it's packed full of, you know, whatever. Yeah. You know, Cactus Canyon. Oh my God. Wow. Yeah. That is very cool. I had to give up on collecting arcade machines. Um, I can move pinball machines. I'm not super big, so um, I can fold them up and I can move them myself. But then, you know, I started collecting a lot of arcade games, and I, I like them okay. But, right. you know, I always gravitated to playing pinball. And mm-hmm. uh, uh, they were so heavy to move. And so I pared down all of my uh, arcade machines. I must have had 25 or so at one mm. point. Now I only keep the vector games. So Oh, wow. 
Now, getting a chance to hang out with some of these folks like Alan, Al Alcorn, one of the original Atari guys, Nolan Bushnell. Oh, yeah, um, Nolan, yeah. I don't know which one of them told me, but like early on, I think it was maybe when I was doing toys, they're like, there's only like five different types of games out there. Like once you know it, then, you know, you can apply it in different levels. He's, and, mm. and again, I wish I would have like wrote it down. He's like putting things in order, destroying things, you know, um, and he's like, yeah, you look at our classic Ataris, they're tried and true because they fit this like one of five dimensions. And right. it's kind of true. It's like, yeah. you know, even a modern game player can go play Centipede and have a great time because it's, yeah, it's kind of it's timeless. Their, yeah. Their lizard brain. Um, I have a Nolan story I got to tell, which is kind of cool. I got to know Nolan uh, many years ago, but not well. He's down in L.A. and you know, just kind of fanned out on him and we yeah, I mean, yeah, at it's... dinner or something. And I think it was about the time he was doing the you winks things. And, mm. you know, oh, Nolan's had a lot of experimental failed companies. He's yeah. a pretty brave guy. He's still, he's doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah, still. he's doing stuff now. Yeah, I see on LinkedIn. Yeah. And his um, kids, yeah. Yeah, Brett has like a, a location-based. Yeah, yeah location are. stuff, something circus. Uh, any recruiter that used to recruit for that. The location based, or yeah, if it's yeah, something like that. Yeah, it was location based stuff. Yeah, yeah. So I kind of knew him. I didn't realize he knew me that well. But you know, when I was talking about my first startup that just imploded, yeah, and I'm sitting in this office. Of course, all these executives they burned all the money, and as soon as like everything went wrong, they just stopped showing up. So <laughs> everyone's fired. I'm right. in an empty building with a bunch of like terminal sitting at their login screens and yeah. like weeping in my beer. Yeah. I get this phone call. Uh yeah. You know, hey Jerry, it's Nolan. I'm like, Nolan? Nolan Bushnell. <laughs> like, like, oh okay. hey Nolan. Right. I didn't know you had my phone number. Right. He's like, I've been following what you did. I gotta try it. It's some trade show, like some prototype of it. It's amazing. It's gonna change the world. And you know, you need to figure out how to keep this going because you really have something. He gave me this little pep talk. And he's like, I can't tell you how to fix the situation you're in, but I've been following and I could see it coming a mile away just from like the outside. Mm -hmm. And he's like, You just need to figure it out. And I'm like, okay. And that was the catalyst for me to go and like talk to other folks that were in the company, like, hey, you know, we are onto something that's really magical. Do you want to give it a go? And thanks to Nolan Bushnell, like this guy I'd only read about in books. Right. Just randomly calls you. <laughs> oh, oh, and one of the things that he said was, um, I was having this conversation with him, like, am I this is such an embarrassing thing. My startup failed and failed so badly. And he's like, Oh, I've destroyed company after company. Like, you know, <laughs> failure. Don't worry about it, kid. Right. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> failure is part of it. Like, you know, right. just go tell those asshole investors that you've learned so much and you're not going to make the same mistakes. And, you know, that's was part of my line early on trying to raise money after this failure is like, right. Trust me, I know what not to do now. Right. I made a in the last seven years, I made a whole slew of new mistakes. But I didn't, <laughs> I didn't remake those other ones, so someone else paid for those other ones. You don't have to worry about it for these this new stuff now. So, yeah, that's no, that's cool. But yeah, it's pretty cool. Our office, uh, we're actually moving to a different space now. It's tore down, which is sad. I would take you on a walking tour and describe, but it was set up like a museum. So a lot of my like rare collection was here and some of the common stuff. But mm -hmm. each room is set up to a different theme. There's an Atari era room. Oh, okay. There's a Sega room, a PlayStation room. There's a Nintendo room. Lots yeah. of cool stuff was here. It's going to get set up when we get to our new space. But um, mm -hmm. uh, it's actually super valuable. Two things with the museum here is, you know, I have a walking tour. So VIPs come through, like investors. Right. I take them right to the Atari room. And this is, maybe I shouldn't reveal my dirty little secret, but <laughs> it's, uh, you know, the story goes, like, there's two cabinets set up. There's the Magnavox Odyssey, the RCA. Mm, I remember the Odyssey, the yeah. Two, you know, all the big mega corporations of the time. These were big companies back in the day trying to get into video games. Coleco. Coleco, yeah, ColecoVision, yeah. And television, and but yeah. Yeah. 
And then there's a cabinet dedicated to Atari, like early Atari. And I'm like, here's two guys in a crummy building in Santa Clara cracked the code for the living room and sold hundreds of millions of games Mm. into living rooms everywhere. Here's the mega corporations, slow moving. They don't understand. They're not nimble enough. It has to be startups to figure out these new spaces when they're developing. Mm -hmm. Then I take them to the next room. Then I take them to the Nintendo room. And then I talk about the virtues of Nintendo, how they're never on the bleeding edge of technology, right? It's always trade-offs, like black and white screens when, you know, on the Game Boy. Game Boy, yeah. yeah. Color. Yeah, so it's this whole thing. It's like what you leave out of the product. Then I go to another room, and there's another theme, and another theme, and then the grand finale is the office where I'm at here, which has really rare stuff in it. and then. I have a cabinet that's dedicated to failures mm. and I walk them through the different things in the cabinet of failures. And I'm like, right. you know, a common thread through all of this technology is not necessarily that it's any of these products were bad. There are a couple bad ones, but you know, it comes down to, you know, too much in it, wrong timing, wrong people. Right. Yeah. And I, yeah. you know, I, there's an emotional connection with something in my office for almost everybody. There's rocket parts and all kinds of stuff. So yeah. by the time I finish the walking tour, then I go pitch them for the money. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. I had one investor not too long ago. He's like, it's just so unfair that you just did this to me. And then, <laughs> yeah. He's got the checkbook out. Wow. Well, you got me. Damn it. I didn't get money from him. What a jerk. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, so where can people find you online? Like, you know, your website, socials, connect with you, stuff like that. Like, uh, So on- it's Tilt. Our company name's Tilt5.com. So it's all spelled out, Tilt5. And it's an inside joke. Can't tell you exactly what it means, but it makes my co-founder and I really happy. So you can go okay. look at the product there and look at some of the games we have. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're a developer, just grab a, all, this, all the systems are developer kits. So I recommend just at least get a two-player pack. They're inexpensive. And then right. play around with it. YouTube, it's also Jerry Ellsworth, J-E-R-I Ellsworth. Um, I haven't been posting there much because I'm just doing the CEO thing, but there's a lot of old historic stuff. If you want to learn about some of my race cars or yeah, how to cool. make microchips in your garage and weird stuff, it's super random. Mm-hmm. YouTube channel is a trip. Like Some people do it professionally. I don't understand how they can do it because people are so angsty about what you post. Oh, right. Yeah, it's like, I like to post a lot of weird stuff. Like, sometimes it'll be art, and then mm. all the people are there for tech will be like, F you, I came right. here for... This is what I want, and stay in this little box, right? Like, Why aren't you um... playing music in the background? It's so boring just listening to you to talk. I'm like, oh. Right. <laughs> anyway, yeah, that's how you can find me. And if okay. you're in the Fremont area, come visit, look at the museum when we're set back up. Yeah, I'm usually out there for GDC um, in Have March. you got a chance to try our... No, I have not. No, I I haven't. I I checked out the website. We crush it at GDC. The lines are just ridiculously long. Cool. It it doesn't matter how many stations we put up. We just end up with long lines. Yeah. And then just like last question, like, you know, what's one piece of advice you give others, you know, in the industry right now, like, and define industry however you want, but whatever industry you'd like to share about. Okay. The thing that helped me the most, and you probably heard it in my theme tonight, is, you know, find your mentors. And Mm -hmm. I have mentors, you know, I'm turned 50 this year, so I'm an old, long-winded (laughs) 50-year-old. Some of my mentors are much younger than I, and some of them are older, and it's just so beneficial. And be sure to, like, thank them. Like, there are some regrets I have on my mentors, those ham radio operators I talked about. They're mm-hmm. long dead. They were very right. old. And I wasn't uh, savvy enough to thank them back then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was probably shown, but I regret right. not thanking them. No, that's that's good to know. And it sounds like you're trying to pay it forward, too. Like, w- when you're doing stuff, you know, you're talking about your YouTube channel and showing people how to do stuff. So, you know, that's cool that you're thinking about that, too, knowing your legacy. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really cool. Oh, I took them all down. It's really heartwarming like people send me um letters from their children and oh, with wow. pictures and drawings and thank you letters and stuff and That's um, 
you know, it makes me almost teary eyed sometimes when these things just randomly show up or are gifted to me. And yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if you can pass it forward, that's, you know, really helpful. Like right. these ham radio operators, like they just planted a seed that developed into, you know, a really good career for me. Right. And then all of a sudden you're fast forward in the factory in, Ch- in China. And you're like, wait a minute. Uh, finger. I, yeah. yeah. Finger. Yeah. See if we can feel something. Right. And, yeah. Yeah. And never in a million years would you have probably thought when you got involved in ham radios that that would you know, turn out to be helpful someday. But, uh, you know, you never know where you're going to go. You never know what's going to happen. So they were always disappointed because I was building pirate radios. I was making AM and FM pirate stations. Oh. And they're, little, <laughs> they're like, oh, that's <laughs> illegal. That's illegal. And I could tell they were like, kind of grinning out of the side of their mouth that I was doing it. And they're like, you yeah. should get your license and do it properly. And you're not allowed to play music. And I'm like, right. I just want to play music. <laughs> but now I'm a ham radio operator. So, you know, again, another thing they planted the seed and now I'm like, Oh yeah, maybe I want to play around with radios, some old school tech. Cool. Well, yeah. okay. well thanks. Right. See you next time. Yes. Thank you. And take care. All, All right. right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.